If you would join with me again in turning to the book of 2 John. 2 John. And we will pick up tonight where we left off this morning. We're looking at verses 7 through 11. 2 John. To put it in its context, we will read beginning at verse 4. John writes, I rejoiced greatly to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as we were commanded by the Father. And now I ask you, dear lady, not as though I were writing you a new commandment, but the one we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk according to His commandments. This is the commandment just as you have heard from the beginning, so that you should walk in it. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch yourselves so that you may not lose what we have worked for, but may win a full reward. Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting. For whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works." Let's go to our God together in prayer this evening. Lord, I'm grateful that when we come into a place like this tonight to give you worship, to meet with our brethren, to listen to your word preached, Lord, you don't ask us to leave our concerns outside the door, but rather we bring them in with us and we bring those concerns before the light of your holy word. I pray that in an increasing way we would realize, Lord, that you mean for us to live every aspect of our lives in the light, being informed by your word as we see, as we consider, as we respond to all those things that we engage in our lives. Lord, I pray that tonight regardless of what the burdens are upon hearts, the hearts of these people who've come in, that, Lord, tonight you would grant us guidance, instruction, correction, strength, protection, preparation. We believe, Lord, in the sufficiency of your word. It is not only inerrant, it is not only authoritative, Lord, your word is sufficient for all the things that we face for all the things that we need. So, Lord, tonight, minister to your church. May your spirit be our teacher. May you open our minds and hearts that we might receive the things you have for us. Strengthen us, Lord, to receive your word well. We will thank you for this. We also pray on behalf of those in our midst who don't know Jesus. We ask for a great outpouring of salvation in these days. Oh, Lord, save many is our desire and our prayer. We'll thank you for what you do in Jesus' name. Amen. Truth, love, and discernment. That's what we're learning about in the book of 2 John. Truth, love, and discernment. How these things function together. True love exists in the realm of truth. Truth expresses itself in genuine love. And where truth and love exist, the people of God are learning discernment. This morning we saw that a commitment to truth and love serves as preparation for the church to be able to withstand false teaching. We noted that little word four at the beginning of verse seven, which connects verses 7 through 11 with what we've learned in verses 4 through 6. And so we've been commanded to walk in the love of Jesus Christ, to walk in the commandments of God, 
And he says to us in verse 7, this is vital because there are many, many imposters that have gone out into the world. That tells me that walking in the love of Jesus Christ, walking in the commandments of God, this is fortification. This is preparation for being able to withstand those deceivers who have gone out into the world. So when we're commanded to walk in truth and love, this is not just that we might please God in the way that we relate to one another, but also that we might be able to please God in the way that we relate to to that which threatens the Lord's church, to the doctrines of demons that we're going to come in contact with through the emissaries of Satan, namely false teachers, the deceivers, the antichrists that are present in this world. That was the second thing we saw this morning. Not only does truth and love serve the commitment to truth and love serve as a preparation to withstand false teaching, but the confession of truth and love then serves as a discerning, identifying standard. How do I know who really belongs to the community? How do I know who's outside of it? How do I know who's my brother? How do I know who is an enemy of the truth? The answer is, do they confess the truth concerning Jesus Christ? Do they love the biblical God? Do they love the Jesus of the Bible? Do they love the biblical gospel? Truth and love then becomes the the standard by which discernment operates in the realm of doctrine. Now tonight we we begin at verse 8. And we see a third principle. We're thinking about truth, love, and deceivers. Tonight we're going to become more specific. Think about truth, love, and drawing the lines. Where do we draw the lines? How do we we know how it is that God would have us to respond to the deceivers? And so we come to a third principle for how to do this, and it's, it's this, a continuance A continuation in truth and love is the distinction between true believers and false teachers. Or we could say between true believers and pseudo-believers, false confessors, but that includes the false teachers that John's talking about in these verses. The demarcation line, the, the difference, the distinction between a genuine believer who knows Jesus Christ and someone who who names the name of Jesus but doesn't know Jesus, someone who comes in the name of Jesus but actually threatens the church, the distinction is found here. True believers continue in the truth that's found in Jesus Christ. They continue in the love of God. And apostates depart from the truth and love that's found in Jesus. As we think about this, the first thing I want to point out is a commandment that we have in verse 8. John gives a commandment for the community of God's people. He says, watch yourselves. Watch yourselves so that you may not lose what we have worked for, but may win a full reward. Watch yourselves. What does he mean by this? Well, I think a a clue as to what he means is actually found in the next verses when he says in verse 9, everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide, does not remain in the teaching of Christ, does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. So when he says, watch yourselves, he's saying, beware, be on the alert, that you are not drawn away outside the teaching. You're not led astray so that you depart from spiritual ground that is everlastingly safe onto ground that is everlastingly damning. Watch yourselves. It's interesting, the next line there in verse 8, so that you may not lose what we have worked for. You may have a little note in your Bible there over the word we. Down below an explanation note that in some manuscripts this reads you. It could read watch yourselves so that you may not lose what you have worked for. But the ESV, the New American Standard, walking through a process to determine how best to settle the question of 
this textual variant. Some of the manuscripts have you, some have we. They, they've settled on the idea that we is the original. And as I looked at it, to the best of my ability, I agree with that. So what is John saying? Watch yourselves, when he says, watch yourselves so that you may not lose what we have worked for. What is he saying? Well, John is speaking on behalf of apostolic ministry. Speaking on behalf of all those who have ministered to these people. He's concerned that the false teachers would have an influence on these people that would put in jeopardy the spiritual work that he and others have carried out in the interest of their souls. And if this we is inclusive, if it includes the reader, then he would also be saying not only what we've worked for, but what you have professed to be working for. At risk in this whole question of what do you do with false teaching and false teachers, at risk is the good work of gospel ministry that you now represent. Right now you represent the good work of gospel ministry, but I want that to remain the case. So watch yourselves. Watch yourselves so that you may not lose what we have all worked for. I think this raises a very important issue, something I want you to, to really grasp hold of. If you have true shepherds, I mean, this, this gives to me insight into the shepherding heart of the Apostle John. If you have true shepherds, then, then they understand that you are Christ's, okay? You are His work. You are His field. You are His sheep. You are His people, bought by the, by the blood of Jesus. You are His, but at the same time, you are ours in this sense that you represent a God-given responsibility and accountability to those who have been called to shepherd your souls. We labor on behalf of the chief shepherd in the interest of your spiritual well-being. One day the chief shepherd will appear and I, along with the other elders of this church, we will have to give an account for how we have done in watching for your souls. So you are Christ, but in a restrictive sense, you are also ours. A responsibility given to God, by God to us, that we'll give an account for. This is how true shepherds think. I told someone the other day, you know, maybe, maybe the job we do would be easy if you just didn't care. But if you care, I think it's the most difficult work in the world. You get up in the morning with the church, you go to bed at night with the church, you walk through the day with the church in your heart. The people of God are the focus of your prayers and concerns and your labors. They represent your passion in the Lord. Paul reveals this very same attitude in 1 Corinthians 9.1. He writes this, Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Now remember what's going on in the church at Corinth. They're rejecting his apostleship. Some of them are. They're resisting his, his work in their lives now at a later stage in their walk with Jesus. And he says, are, are not you my workmanship in the Lord? Aren't you my work? 1 Corinthians 4.15, he writes this, For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I urge you then be imitators of me. Paul, are you some egomaniac? No, not at all. I'll tell you what he is. He's someone who understands that he's nothing. I'll make that plain in just a moment. He understands that he's nothing, but he also understands that in a sense he's something. That is, he has been placed by God in a unique relationship with these people, and it is in their best interest that they allow him to be a shepherd to them. He says, that's why I sent you Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach them everywhere in every church. Do you know the personal nature of that? I mean, Paul isn't even saying this on behalf of the body of the apostles. He's saying this on behalf of his own individual relationship with that church. In Romans 15, 20, he writes, And thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. 
Now, this does not mean, and I mentioned it, but I want to underscore it, this does not mean that Paul saw himself as some kind of spiritual lone ranger. Because listen to what he says in the very same letter, 1 Corinthians 3, 6, he writes this, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. You see, we're co-workers, we're co-laborers, yet we still have individual roles and responsibilities in this larger work. Verse 9, he writes, for we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation. And someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So when Paul says to the Corinthian church, you know, I'm your father through the gospel, when he says to them, you're my workmanship, he's not some spiritual lone ranger. But what it does mean is that Paul's ministry he saw as a personal, passionate responsibility. In fact, in 1 Thessalonians 2, he represented his work and the work of the other apostles like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. In that same passage down in verse 11, 1 Thessalonians 2, he, just, he characterizes it this way, For you know how like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Peter reflects the, the same mindset, but he broadens it out to include all elders. 1 Peter 5, 2, shepherd the flock of God that's among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for sh shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. I would just ask you, do any of those passages sound like these men felt no personal investment when it came to the people of God? No, they're fully invested. And so when John says, watch yourselves so that you may not lose what we have worked for, he's saying these false teachers represent a threat to my work. They represent the exact opposite of what we have been working for in your lives. We work for the truth. They represent deception. We work for Christ. They represent antichrist. We're working on behalf of your eternal well-being, your eternal life. These teachers represent eternal damnation. He is passionately, authoritatively calling for them to wake up, to be alert, to be vigilant. Watch yourselves that these kinds of men, and by the way, women, you do understand we don't just have false prophets in this world, we have false prophetesses too. Be careful that they don't draw you away from the things that faithful shepherds have worked so hard to see you established in. So he has a commandment for the community. You be watchful. That you don't lose what we've worked for. Here's the second thing you see. A course for the community. The commandment has to do with watchfulness. But now he sets before us two pathways, two outcomes. There is the outcome of, of loss and there's the outcome of a full reward. You see it in verse 8? So that you may not lose what we've worked for, but instead may win a full reward. So he envisions two courses, two pathways. One leads to loss. The other leads to reward. There is a disaster envisioned. There is a desire encouraged. First of all, the disaster envisioned. He says so that you may not lose may not lose what we've worked for. What does he mean? John, what do you mean when you say that they, 
You don't want them to lose it. In what sense could it be lost? Well, some people take this to mean, you know, rewards for service, rewards that belong to believers. So they think what's being envisioned here is that he's warning them so that they don't lose some sort of reward that's handed out to believers. You know, this has nothing to do with everlasting life. This just has to do with rewards. I don't think that's right. I think the loss that he's envisioning here is an everlasting loss. I think the loss that he's envisioning here is the, is the loss of one's soul. You listen to these false teachers, you be drawn away by these false teachers. What's at risk here? What, what's being set before you is the possibility of your everlasting damnation. So why do you say that, Richard? Because in verse 7, what do these false teachers represent? They represent the Antichrist. In verse 9, how does he describe what's going on here? Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ, what does he say? Does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. I mean, you follow these people who are false teachers, you give evidence, you don't have God. Our friend Tom Schreiner I think did a great job of making the case well. He said this, quote, The context refers to deceivers and antichrists who have a seriously deficient Christology. John does not think their error is insignificant but damning, according to verse 7. Moreover, verse 9 immediately follows the warning in verse 8, and it shows that eternal life is in view. Those who progress and do not continue in orthodox teaching do not have God. Conversely, those who continue in the faith have both the Father and the Son. Deviation from the teaching here has ultimate consequences. Since those who are unfaithful do not even have God. Given that verse 8 is folded between verses 7 and 9, these verses have to do with whether one belongs to God. And the warning in verse 8 should be understood as referring to eternal life. I agree with him. I agree wholeheartedly. You say, well, why would you warn believers about the possibility of losing salvation? We've talked about this many times, haven't we, church? It's because when you tell a believer, you be careful, your soul is at stake, what does a believer do? They listen. And when someone doesn't listen to the warning passages of the Word of God, what are they giving evidence of? Are they in danger of losing salvation? Or are they simply giving evidence they never, what, had salvation? They were never saved. God's sheep listen to the voice of their shepherd. And so when the Lord Jesus Christ warns His sheep, they listen, they give heed. And so it is not wrong at all to say to a believer, a professing believer, who is flirting with doctrines about Jesus that are damning, you go on ahead and you're giving evidence you don't have God. Your soul is at risk. So there's the... the disaster that's envisioned. Notice the desire that's encouraged verse, in verse 8, but may win a full reward. Rewarded fully. And what he envisions there is the fullness of joy at God's right hand. The desired outcome is eternal life. Run the race to the finish. So you have a command to the community, you watch yourselves, you have this, these courses set before us. One ends up in loss. The other ends up in reward. And then this contrast is underscored in verse 9. Everyone, everyone, see this isn't for some, this isn't a few, everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. 
Beware of walking the pathway that these false teachers have walked, that these false teachers represent. Because if you follow them and you go down that trail, you are giving evidence that you don't have God. Because everyone, everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Isn't it interesting the way the Spirit of God through John words this? Everyone who goes on ahead. You see that? Who goes on ahead. New American Standard has who goes too far. The idea is this, to go beyond the teaching of Christ. That is to go beyond the teaching that has come from Christ. To go beyond the teaching that rightly represents Christ. To go beyond the teaching that has been given to us by Christ through the apostles. To go outside of the once for all delivered unto the saints' faith. To leave the ground of orthodoxy. Perhaps in the name of progress. That gives evidence you don't have God. Imagine a piece of property, and around this piece of property is a fence, and on the fence all around the property are warning signs. And the warning signs say this, proceed beyond this point, and you are on damnable ground. Do you know what false teachers do? They go on ahead. They leave the safe ground. They proceed onto the damning soil of false doctrine. They move outside the boundaries of the teaching of Christ. They may do it in the name of having some sort of new revelation. They may do it in, in the name of some deeper teaching, greater wisdom some special spirit-imparted insight. Make no mistake about it. It represents fleshly imagination and demonic doctrines. It is deadly. Watch yourselves. John says, watch yourselves. You are flirting with disaster. To state it positively, we can say this. God's people or identified by where they stay. God's people are identified by what they remain loyal to. He says this, whoever abides in, remains in the teaching, has both the Father and the Son. These false teachers don't remain there. They don't abide in the teaching of Christ. But the one who has both the Father and the Son, they do remain there. They stay within the boundaries of the teaching of Christ. They stay within the boundaries of the truths of God's Word. John, how can you make this statement? How can you say that anyone who goes on, who goes beyond the teachings of Christ, and obviously he means by that, and they remain gone, right? They cross the line and they stay there. They don't have God. But the ones who remain within the teaching of Christ, and they are loyal to the apostles' doctrine, how can you say that these people have God and these people do not? Isn't it possible that someone who is truly converted could, could depart from the teachings of Christ and stay gone? Well, listen to what John writes in 1 John 4.1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they're from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and, and now is in the world already. Let's just stop there and recognize something. He says standing behind all, every teaching is a spirit. Does this teaching represent the Spirit of God or does this teaching represent the Spirit of Antichrist? Next verse, little children, you are from God and have overcome them. Who's the them there? The false teachers. 
The children of God have overcome those who disseminate false doctrine. You have overcome them. How? How? John, how have we overcome them? Next statement. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. You want to know how you've overcome the false teachers? You have God's Spirit living within you. Salvation has not just changed your status. Salvation has changed you. And that includes now the indwelling truth teacher. He guards and protects and preserves and keeps the people of God in the truth. He says this, they, the false teachers, are from the world. Therefore, they speak from the world. That is, their teaching represents worldly doctrines. Doctrines that represent the world system, the demonically inspired and empowered world system. They speak from the world, get this, and the world listens to them. We are from God. Now, now John's writing as an apostle, isn't he? We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. I mean, he's not, he's not vague about this, is he? If you have the indwelling truth teacher and you are presented with apostolic doctrine or worldly doctrine, God's people listen to the doctrine that comes from the Spirit of God. That's their pattern. This is what will ultimately be true of them. In 1 John 2, 18, listen to what he writes. Children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know it's the last hour. They, these Antichrists, went out from us, but they were not of us. Listen to this statement. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. Church, if that's clear to you, would you say amen? amen. If you are of us, you stay with us. That is, you stay in the, within the boundaries of the truth of Jesus. Not only just concerning who He is, but that truth that has come from Him. They would have continued with us. Notice the next statement. But they went out that it might become plain that they, are, that they all are not of us. You see, it's not that they changed colors. It's not that they changed stripes. It's not that it became something that they weren't already. It just became plain. It just became evident. Verse 20, but you have been anointed by the Holy One. What anointing is he talking about? He's talking about the presence of the Spirit of God Himself. And you all have knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it. And because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar? But he who denies that Jesus is the Christ. This is the Antichrist. He who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that He made to us, eternal life. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you, but the anointing that you receive from Him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. Now, now just stop there for a moment. Let me explain that. He's not saying there's no place in the church for human teachers. It's not what He's saying. What He is saying is this. You are not at the mercy of human teachers. You have a divine teacher. You have the indwelling Holy Spirit of God. God Himself has brought you into the truth. God Himself will keep you in the truth. But as His anointing teaches you about everything and is true and is, and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide in Him. You continue with Christ. You stay within that, that, that fence line of orthodox truth. You stay in the truth that has come from Christ and rightly explains Christ. So if you look at our text again, when John says, 
Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. He is able to say this because genuine believers have the Spirit of God. And the Holy Spirit of God is the Spirit of truth. And the Father and the Son and the Spirit keep believers in the truth. And what that means is those who have the Spirit of God listen to John and listen to the other apostles. In our day, we can say, listen to the Word of God. Listen to apostolic truth. And those who have the Spirit of God heed the warnings of God. So when the chief shepherd says to his sheep through the preaching of the Word of God, you be careful, you beware, you be alert, you be vigilant, the sheep of the Lord Jesus Christ say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, we will. So a commitment to truth and love prepares us to face these false teachers. The confession of truth and love is the standard by which we measure them. And then a continuance in truth and love is the demarcation line between true believers and those who are not truly saved, and that includes the false teachers. They become evident, they become manifest by their departure from that truth that is found in Jesus, the teaching of Christ, as he puts it in verse 9. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. This leads to our fourth principle. He tells us how we're prepared. He tells us how to identify them. He tells us what the difference is. The fourth thing he tells us in verses 10 and 11 is now here's how you deal with them. We, we can put it this way. The cooperation with truth and love sets the boundary, the boundaries for the believer's participation in ministry. Where does God call you to participate in ministry, to be a help, to be an assistant? Only where that ministry represents the truth and love of Jesus Christ. Truth and love sets the boundaries. Truth and love tells us where participation is pleasing to God. Notice the believer's response to those who depart, verse 10. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting. You know this, we've talked about it before. These first century teachers traveled around. They needed lodging. They needed accommodations in order to carry out their work. John is saying, if they don't represent the biblical Jesus, the biblical gospel, you don't help them. To receive them into the house would be to provide accommodations. To receive them into the house would be to feed them and clothe, you know, not clothe them, but feed them and, and put shelter over them in terms of your house. It would be to assist them in their work. And he says, in no uncertain terms, you don't do that. But he says something more that is amazing and instructive. He says, or give him any greeting. Not only do you not help him, you don't leave him or others with the impression that you agree with him. When he says don't greet him, the, the, the word itself has, has in it the idea of rejoicing. So you greet him joyfully. It's, it's you embrace him like a brother. We might say it this way, you don't say to him Blessings. God bless you. Godspeed. I'm amazed at how modern evangelicalism has intellectualized and emotionalized its way into granting legitimacy to teachers and movements of doctrine that are absolutely damnable. We've come to a place where we practice a kind of love that is a stranger to Scripture. And we've come to a place where we find it unsophisticated and uncivilized to practice a kind of forthrightness that has always characterized true men of God. 
I'm afraid that we're more concerned about what men think of us than what God thinks of us. We're more concerned about our reputation as being sophisticated than the souls of God's people. Read the Old Testament prophets. Read about them on the pages of God's Word and ask yourself a question. Were the faithful prophets of God in the Old Testament vague about the truth? Church, were they vague? And then ask yourself a follow-up question. Think about the apostles. Were they vague about where they stood? John not only says don't help them, he says don't greet them. Don't treat them like you're on the same team. Now, I want to be clear about something. This is not teaching us to be unkind to people. This is not teaching us to be hateful. Remember, we said it this morning. False teachers are known not only by the substance of what they say, but the spirit of their ministry. And we know of groups in our world right now that may technically stand on a side of, a, of an issue or, or two or three or four. They may stand on the side of what would technically be right, but their spirit doesn't represent Christ at all. So I'm not talking about, nor, nor do we understand God's Word in any place to teach that what we are to represent is some sort of hateful response to someone. But what I am saying is you can, be, you can be civil and kind and polite and mannerly and at the same time, listen, leave no doubt in anyone's mind that wh where you stand and where they stand is not the same. And where they stand is damnable according to the Word of God. Why? Why do we draw these lines? Why do we not participate with that which doesn't really represent the love and truth of Jesus Christ? Why? Verse 11, for whoever greets him, isn't it interesting? He doesn't even pick up on the, on the receives him into the house. It may be these two things are to be thought of together, you know, sort of synonymously. But nonetheless, notice, whoever greets him does what? Takes part in his wicked works. I can say it this way, if I leave the impression with anyone that a dangerous person is not dangerous, that damnable doctrine isn't really damnable, that what is dangerous is really benign, and then someone who has looked to me or is influenced by me as a result of my perhaps cowardly or self-preserving response to this. They look to me and as a result they give their ear to, the, to this person and then they're led astray. I've contributed to that. My lack of clarity, my willingness to be vague has led to someone else's spiritual injury. That's serious, wouldn't you agree? So what do we see in these verses? Love and truth are discerning. Love and truth defines the community. Love and truth identifies the ones who threaten the community. Love and truth draws the lines so that we do not give space or help to the work of deceivers and antichrists. So let me finish tonight by asking us, where have we been on all of this? Have you been entertaining teaching that doesn't accord with the truth? And can I just say as a quick side note, some of the, some of the worst stuff that people give, them, give their minds to and their ears to comes in a devotional form. I wasn't even aware of it until today, but I looked at it just briefly before this afternoon. But you know, this devotional called Jesus Calling, is anybody familiar with that? Or apparently this... this woman is, is writing a devotional and, and trying, I guess, to summarize biblical truth in a way as though Jesus were speaking in the first person. And just a little bit that I read, some of what she says isn't what Jesus says. I mean, are you careful about what you give your mind to? 
what you give your heart to, what you, what you read and say, this is a blessing, what you pass on to others? Have you been entertaining teaching that doesn't accord with the truth? And man, I tell you, false teaching, it's like wildfire. Prayer of Jabez, it's spread everywhere. And right now, this thing I didn't even know about today, this Jesus calling, I mean, you've got devotional materials and pretty soon, I'm sure, study Bibles and it spreads. Where are you at in, in all of that? Have you been guilty of assisting someone who's leading others astray? Do you understand the need to watch yourself? Are you more concerned with how men view you than how God views you? And I think one of the great challenges for all of us in ministry today would be this final question. Are you more concerned with academic respectability than biblical fidelity? Because I think we live in a day when academic respectability means being more open-minded than we should. You want to know how open-minded I want to be? I want to be as open-minded as the truth. Doesn't mean I can't read for the purpose of instructing and protecting and interacting and all the rest. Can't read what, what I don't agree with. It doesn't mean I can't interact with it. But at the end of the day, I want to be clear. I want to be clear about where we stand, what the Bible says. As narrow as the truth. And if that means we lose respectability, so be it. Because what we want is to hear, well done, faithful servant. And we don't underestimate what's at stake. What's at stake are the souls of men and women. The church would say, Amen. let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your gracious, loving shepherding warnings to us. And we thank you that you have so made us through the saving work of your Son, so created us together with him and in him that we heed those warnings. We thank you that the Apostle John was able to say, all of us who have the Spirit of God, we, we hear Him. We listen to Him. We listen to the apostles. We listen to those who gave to us the truth of Your Son. So, Lord, lead us in this world in a way where we lovingly, truthfully, faithfully, courageously, graciously, patiently, but clearly stand in the place where you've called us to stand, stand in the place of the truth and love of Jesus. Help us to be careful. Help us to be watchful. Help us not to overestimate our own strength, but to humbly heed your warnings, knowing, Lord, that you keep us. We ask for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together.